All right, let's get started here. A couple of review questions. What did Jefferson say that made his inauguration speech famous? Hell. Every word you said is right except Americans, although I think we can all infer that's what he was saying. Evelyn. You're all Federalists. You're all Republicans. You got it. Where did, where did Jefferson serve as president? Go ahead. Washington, D.C. Why is the election of 1800 a critical election turning point? <clears throat> Some historians say it's the most important election in history. Kaylee. Give me one. Sarah, what were you going to say? Okay, it's all right. Go ahead. And the last one, but not the least. Amy, saw your hand next. Why is that important to mention the Constitution was upheld? Constitution's questioned all the time. Freedom of speech. There's like 10,000 cases every day on freedom of speech. Would you believe that? 10,000 cases. Constitution's always been questioned. Why is it important in 1800 to point that out? Bryce? Because uh, it was a test of the Constitution because it was still pretty new. Yeah, don't forget. They fought long and hard over that Constitution to begin with. Boy, you scrap it now. We got a problem. Aiden, your fifth great grandfather would have had a problem. It was a test. The Constitution passed. What famous American supported Thomas Jefferson? Good. Hamilton. Yes, Hamilton. So who didn't he support? You got to say it. You got to say it. Sarah, you're the actress. Say it. Good job. Everybody remember that one? You used it, didn't you? I know you did. Everyone's saying not me, but everybody else did. Okay. What did Jefferson promise he would not do to James Baird, who was a Federalist in the House of Representatives? What did he promise he would not do? Aiden, get in the game. Get rid of most of the... Uh... Yeah, and you know, he did get rid of a lot, including up on the screen. What are two that Jefferson really hated? Remember, he did write the Kentucky resolutions. Georgia. Who's that guy in the bottom left saying he liked them? See that? Look at this. Aiden, who is that? How do you get on the Supreme Court? Aiden, stop that or it's going to be up on my desk. How do you get on the Supreme Court, Aiden? You get appointed by the president. And a little more to it. You get approved by the Senate. Now we're moving. Okay. Number three, once again. Evelyn. There are no requirements. No requirements, yes. No age requirements, no citizenship requirements. No um, living in a state for seven years or nine years or 25 or 35 or 30. What office do you have to be 30 to hold? Little civics question. Kaylee, saw your hand. It is the Senate. House, how old do you have to be? Anybody? 25? Yeah. How about president? 35. That means I can't run. <laughs> uh, I don't see. I've been here 28 years. So I, w I started teaching when I was six. Right. Okay. And we got to this about one of the last things. What did the impeachment of Samuel, not Salmon Chase, establish? And yes, I did specify because there is going to be a Salmon, and that's pronounced Salmon, not Salmon as in the fish. Coming up in Lincoln's cabinet, actually. We'll get to that. Evelyn, go ahead. Uh, judges 
criminal activity. And that actually was to apply to all impeachments, including presidents. And obviously we've had a dose of that over the last two years. Okay. One of those stories for another day. Barbary versus Madison. Here's our essential question. How did the Supreme Court decision in Marbury versus Madison strengthen the federal judiciary, the Supreme Court? And I'm sure you have a handle on that just after doing your handout, but we're going to go through it anyway. Marbury versus Madison. You have to know this court case. This is as in, this is critical to the Supreme Court because you know what could have happened? The Supreme Court could have gone bye-bye, believe it or not. Really could have. Hmm. How many justices are there in the Supreme Court? Nine. That actually fluctuated every year until 1859 when it actually became set in stone. But actually, Congress can change that. And they've been talking about doing that over the last year. Obviously, that could promote some controversy there because the president appoints and, of course, Senate approves. And if the president is one party and the Senate's one party, and then you throw in more judges, then obviously that can sway the Supreme Court uh, one way or another. Okay. And as I mentioned before, as you can see, what happens when the president who appoints you leaves office once again? You stay. You stay. Now you can retire. You don't have to serve for life. Okay. You can resign. But a lot do stay a long time. Okay, here we go. So Marbury versus Madison. Well, we're going to actually flash back to the president before Jefferson. And who's that guy? John Adams. John Adams. There we go. President Adams appointed what were called midnight judges at the very end of his term in 1800. What do you think that means? Midnight judges. I'm thinking of a song back in the day. They said, I'm going to wait till the midnight hour. I can't think of the band that actually played that. I don't think it was actually the animals. Somebody Google that real quick. Wait till the midnight hour. It's a song. I don't know if it's the actual name of the song or the phrase in the song. See, there we go. Problem solving. I'll tell you that. And yes, just so you know, when you see what year that song came out, that was actually before I was even born. <laughs> Do we have it? Oh, it's loading. Okay. Oh, not even who I thought. Well, he sang for the animals. Anyway, Marbury versus Madison. So let's go back to my question there. Maggie, you had your hand up. What does that mean? Midnight judges. Exactly. Yes. If you wait till the midnight hour, you wait until the last possible second. In other words, he procrastinated. He waited till 15 minutes before class starts to get out of bed. You know, that type of stuff. There you go. <laughs> so the problem, the commission papers were never delivered to Marbury. Marbury was one of the midnight judges. Now, what does commission papers mean? I'll make it real simple for you. It's a fancy way of saying basically you're hired, okay? It's the commission papers means we're commissioning you as a judge. In other words, we're hiring you. That's all it means, okay? The commission papers were never delivered to Marbury, so he couldn't take the bench. Now, I want you to understand what take the bench means. What does that, what do you think that means? Take the bench. Go ahead. Be on the uh, like be one of the people in the Supreme Court. Okay. Well, now Marbury, I should also point out, he was actually not appointed to the Supreme Court, but he was one of the midnight judges, and he was definitely a Federalist. Remember, Adams is what party? Just said it. He's a Federalist. So if you are the president backing up here, who do you think you're going to appoint? You think he's going to appoint Republicans? No. Think Donald Trump at the end of his presidency would appoint people that sided with Democrats? I don't think so. Well, he's appointing pro federalists, okay? <clears throat> I want you to know this. It was actually Adam's Secretary of State, John Marshall, 
who didn't deliver the commission papers. And I do want you to know that. See, this quick case can be kind of a puzzle here. It was actually his own Secretary of State who didn't deliver the commission papers. <laughs> How do you think that went over when he told Adams he didn't do it? <laughs> be like not making your bed before you leave in the morning. Oh, boy. Go ahead, Ella. Exactly. Want to yes. Very good. He did or he didn't want to. No, no, wait, no, wait. What did you say there? Did Adam want to put the papers? Yes. He did. Okay. So he yes. wanted to die in the Secretary of State to do his task coverage. Yeah. In other words, Secretary of State dropped the ball. But it's important to understand it was actually John Marshall because Marshall plays a role in the Supreme Court, the very court that is in question here. Okay, so the commission papers are never delivered to Marbury. Marbury wants his job. That's why it's going to be Marbury versus Madison. Now, you might say, well, who is Mad why is Madison involved? Yes, he's not even going to be president, but he's actually Secretary of State in Jefferson's cabinet. We'll get to that. Okay, so backing up here, commission papers are never delivered to Marbury, so he couldn't take the bench. Now, taking the bench means you become a judge. If you take the bench, you're becoming a judge. <clears throat> so he was actually appointed, as you can see there, to Justice of the Peace. Today, we call that district magistrate. Okay, same thing. It was Adam's Secretary of State who didn't actually deliver the commission papers. So Marbury gets mad. He wants his job. He says, based on the Constitution, I should be allowed to have this position. Now put yourself in his place and you can understand. <clears throat> now, by this time, Jefferson's in office. And Jefferson does something you could say a little underhanded here. He wants his own Secretary of State, James Madison, to block the Midnight Judges, which includes Marbury. It should not be him, Marbury, including Marbury. Jefferson says, I don't want these people. They're Federalists. I'm Republican. So he actually sends his own Secretary of State to block Marbury. Marbury says, that's not fair. I was appointed duly by the president. I should have my job. So the case goes to the Supreme Court. Now we're getting to the key point here. Madison thinks he has it in the bag because he's like, no, I got this. I, I'll block him. Don't worry about a thing. <clears throat> Why is this case so important? Well, obviously, if you're thinking of Marbury, you can em empathize with him. But that's not the key of the case, okay? Before we go any further here, let's take a look at this. John Marshall is actually the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. But here's a question, and here's a quote. Let's see if we can figure out why this case is so important. Let's read this quote here and see if we can understand it. Jesse, if you would, please. Good morning, before giving to to issue writs of commandment yep. to public officers that appears not to be warranted by the Constitution, and it becomes necessary to inquire whether a jurisdiction so conferred can be exercised. Okay, let's pause there before we go any further. <clears throat> Read that first part again, and everybody pay close attention to it, and let's see if we can figure out what Chief Justice Marshall is saying. Go ahead, Jesse, please. The authority, therefore, given to the Supreme Court to issue writs of mandamus to public officers appears not to be warranted by the Constitution, and it becomes necessary to inquire whether jurisdiction so conferred can be exercised. Okay, so can anybody, anybody want to infer what that first part is saying? Basically, the first sentence. Evelyn. Um, it's saying that the Constitution 
doesn't say that um, the Supreme Court can like elect public officers or like I don't know what amendments. I'm just assuming, but because the Constitution doesn't say that, so they have to consider whether or not they can do that. Exactly. And a writ of mandamus means to carry out the appointment in this case. What an excellent answer. What they're saying there in their own in their own sentence is Chief Justice Marshall saying we don't have power. We're the Supreme Court, but we don't have the power because it's not in the Constitution. And that's what's critical to understand about this. That's why this case is so important. Now, what happens that changes all that is coming up here. All right, let's continue on there with if both law. If both, yes, the, if both the law and the Constitution apply to a particular case, so that the court must either decide that case disregarding the Constitution or conformably to the Constitution disregarding the law. The court must determine which of these Constitution rules govern. Rules governs. The, ju the judicial power of the United States is extended to all cases arising under the Constitution. Now we're getting somewhere because look at that last sentence. Did we kind of take a turn there? The judicial power of the United States is extended to all cases arising under the Constitution. You see how that changed from the first sentence. Okay, so let's go to this part. What ends up coming out of this case is called the Judiciary Act, and this we want to know. The Judiciary Act. which was, became law in 1789. This is one of those deals where a Supreme Court case, and if you study the Supreme Court and Supreme Court rulings even more, you'll understand that sometimes Supreme Court cases actually state a precedent. Okay, I'll say it again. Sometimes Supreme Court cases, the rulings can actually state a precedent, and believe it or not, sometimes Supreme Court cases can become law. Not supposed to. It's supposed to be the legislature that passes laws. But in this case, the Judiciary Act is established. Now, what does this mean? <laughs> well, first of all, let me go back to the case and I'll tell you what happens, and then we'll go from there. <clears throat> Twist in the case. By this time, John Marshall, the same man who forgot to deliver the papers to Marbury, which would have made him a justice of the peace, was sworn into in as a chief justice of the Supreme Court. So the same guy is now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, okay? <clears throat> Jefferson refused to allow the midnight judge, Marbury, to be a judge. And by the way, to end the story on that part, Marbury never did become a judge. Imagine the poor guy. He was duly elected, but or duly appointed, but he never got to be. The Supreme Court actually ruled Marbury should be a judge. I look at Georgia, she's confused. Didn't I just tell you that he never became a judge? But look what the Supreme Court ruled. Are you confused now? Yeah. The Supreme Court ruled that he should be a judge, but at the same time, the Supreme Court also ruled that they don't have the power to enforce their own ruling. And that's the point. The Supreme Court also determined they do not have the power to enforce their own ruling. <clears throat> and the bottom line is they could not enforce their own ruling. That's going to come up big time with a guy named Andrew Jackson who is going to actually remove Native Americans, even though the Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional. We'll talk more about that. <clears throat> so, although Marshall stated the court had no authority to expand the power of the Supreme Court, <clears throat> it did establish the principle of judicial review, and that I want you to know. Judicial review, this is critical. If you don't remember any twist and turn of the case, you want to remember this. 
it established the idea of judicial review. Well, not idea, the entire concept. Okay, let's read through this. <clears throat> so Congress passes a law, and look at this. Rice and please. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. What does that mean, to say what the law is? I think of that as sometimes in teaching, believe it or not, to use an example, whereas... Sometimes, no reflection on you, you're awesome. But sometimes I feel like the next day I have to tell you what I taught you because I'm not sure that I got it through like I wanted to. Put that on me, not you. To determine what the law is, what does that mean? Go ahead. Basically to say like if what the case is about is within the law or not. Okay, go one, one step further. Go one step further. If it is what or what? Go ahead. Or unconstitutional, yes. And that's what you want to know, okay? The significance of Marbury established judicial review. The Supreme Court can declare laws unconstitutional. That's what you want to know. It gives the court the power of judicial review. The Supreme Court can determine if the law is constitutional or unconstitutional. What happened now is the Supreme Court is elevated and it's elevated to the level of the executive and legislative branch. The Supreme Court is should say the entire judiciary is considered equal to so let's take a second and read through that Evelyn if you would please significance of Marbury established judicial review the Supreme Court can declare federal laws unconstitutional the Supreme Court has the authority to oversee the activities of the Congress the legislature and the president the executive and can rule them unconstitutional the result is that the Supreme Court, the judicial branch, has as much power as the other two branches of government. And that's what you want to know. That picture of the Supreme Court has changed. Okay, that's one of the older pictures. You can see Ruth Bader Ginsburg there in the front. And she has passed away. And I believe Amy Coney Barrett. That's her seat. Okay, so it has changed. Okay, and that is the case Marbury versus Madison. Okay, so John Marshall, a little bit more about him. He was Chief Justice at the time, and through judicial review, he was able to increase the power of the Supreme Court. That is why there is a huge statue of John Marshall outside the Supreme Court building. And as we had stated before, if the president who appoints you leaves office, you stay. And he was appointed by a Federalist, but he did stay. And kind of set that whole tone that you stay on the Supreme Court. Served for several Republican presidents, including Jefferson. Okay, let's go to your handout and let's be extra thorough here. Let's go to page two. And you can turn the other light on since this is all on paper there. Um, above the heading, Marbury versus Madison. Ellie answered it yesterday. What did the impeachment of Solomon Chase establish once again? Page two. Oh, Got it. What was the most important? No, what was the Oh, sorry. Okay, judges can only be removed from the 
Yes, must be criminal, must be an unconstitutional act, etc. Good. Marbury versus Madison. What was the most important appointment, judicial appointment, President Adams made before he left office? Go ahead. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so the one that we just answered, wasn't it Samuel Chase? Or wasn't it? Yeah, I have it spelled wrong on the handout. That's why I emphasized up on the screen. Okay. Yeah, the handout, yes, it's Samuel. Solomon comes up later in Lincoln's presidency. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. That's why I wanted to correct it. I just didn't point out that on the handout, I typed the wrong name. Thanks for asking. Okay, what was the most important judicial appointment Adams made before he left office? Go ahead. John Marshall is the Chief Justice. Over to page three. John Marshall was more responsible than any other justice for making the Supreme Court into what? A lean, mean, fighting machine. No, that's that's... A football movie I watched one time. Ella, what do you got? You got it. <clears throat> Supreme Court, very minor, minor body until what court case, everybody? Marbury. Why wasn't Marbury appointed as a judge, Bryson? Um, although the, he was like appointed, the papers never got delivered to him in time. And the Supreme Court, though, ruled that he could be a judge. They could not enforce their own ruling, and that we want to understand, okay? So why didn't Jefferson allow Madison to deliver the appointment of Marbury into office? Yes, wanted to appoint Republican, yes. How did the court unanimously agree with Chief Justice John Marshall? Anybody that one? Go ahead, Amy. Couldn't enforce it, yes. Although Marbury was never able to become a judge, how did the case strengthen the Supreme Court? Go ahead. The right and power of judicial review. Yes. Now the next part there, you can see we are expanding westward. Anybody remember the name of the treaty that said the United States stopped at the Mississippi River? I can't hear you. Be confident in that answer. Move the hand away from the mouth and scream it out so we can all hear. Uh, Pinkney's? Yeah, Pinkney. See, you're right. There you go. Pinkney's Treaty. Who gets the land west? Oh, I don't know. I think I Sure. <laughs> Who gets the land west? Good. Spain. Spain. Guess what? Spain's going to lose it. France is going to get it. And we're going west. And what's coming your way? I had y'all build up. What's coming your way? Spain's going to lose it. France is going to get it. What's coming your way? Louisiana. Yeah, that purchase thing, which is very controversial. Very controversial. The more land you have, the more you got to protect. What happens to the existing state's power when you add more states? Stay with me here. Let's, okay, so right now in this room, we have what? How many people? Don't make this too hard. You have those high math classes. You can count. We have 10. Okay. So let's just say about 10. What happens if I add 10 more people? So right now you vote on everything. You 10. What happens when I get, I add 10 more? Go ahead. Yeah, so imagine how the existing states felt when you actually purchased Louisiana. Today we look at it as the smartest deal ever. You're buying land at about three to four cents an acre. Yeah, I think we'd all take that deal, wouldn't we? Now, yeah, it made us a world power and all that. But back then, there was a lot of controversy with this. In fact, the Federalists say we're leaving. Because most people in the new territories are Republicans. And the Federalists actually wanted to break away. Who was the leading Federalist at the time? Everybody say Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Hamilton. But who actually led the breakaway? Aaron Burr. Ooh. Ooh, there's going to be a fight. We'll get to that. <laughs> Jefferson is actually somewhat controversial figure. Okay, let's take a look at this. <clears throat> And you don't need to write it down. These are just some statements that have been made. He was a slave owner, yet he wanted to end slavery, okay, in the Declaration. 
He advocated for strong state governments, but he actually expanded federal power. Purchasing Louisiana 